spend that time here with us this weekend here at TCAT. Uh, I'm going to do things just a little bit different here in the middle of the service than we normally do. I want to point you to a few things I hope that you will pick up on. Uh, and we call that our top three. If you want to know the three things we want you to know right now about what's going on, uh, you need to go to tcat.church slash top three. I'm going to give you what those three things are really fast, and then I want to share a little about us, where we're going from here, and then we're going to sing another really amazing song. So uh, the three things we want you to know about, number one, S'more Tuscaloosa is coming. That is our fall fest this year. Isn't that an awesome name, S'more Tuscaloosa? Uh, and so it's going to be September the 30th, or October the 30th, right here uh, at TCAT in the parking lot. It's a Sunday. We're going to celebrate the end of Be Rich that day. We're going to have s'mores for everybody. We're going to have pretty amazing music. We're going to have games and candy and costume things for the kids, all sorts of stuff. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. Check out our website for more information on that one. Uh, the second thing that's in our top three is called Renovate. Renovate is a really, uh, really intentional program. It's a, it's a step program that we do on Monday nights for people who just, you know, there's something stuck in your life. And you're stuck there. You don't know how to take a step. You're not sure where you need to go next. Renovate is the place you should check out. Mondays at 6 o'clock. There's some information about that in your top three. And then finally, uh, w within the top three, we're talking all about Be Rich, lots of different things that are going on there, so make sure that you check out what's there. And along with that, uh, we're doing a lot of great stuff with your kids, um, so there's going to be some information about how your kids can be involved and be rich through the month, and just a little bit about Jumpstart, which uh, you should have heard about last week, and in some ways your kids can be involved in that too. So lots and lots and lots of great stuff for you to check out in our top three. If you don't know who we are, if you've never been here before, the thing we really want you to know about us is that we feel like it's our, our, our mission to lead you into a growth relationship with Jesus. Like everything that we do, uh, everything we've been doing, everything we're going to do for the next few minutes while we're together is really just for that uh, because we feel like Jesus is the answer to the questions you've been asking um, and if you haven't figured that out yet we want to help you uh, and if you have figured that out we want to help you take your next great step whatever that might look like for you. We also say a lot around here that we are for Tuscaloosa uh, and being for Tuscaloosa we, we, we say that because we love our community. Um, Jesus gave us this command that we should love uh, the Lord our God and we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And both of those things together were kind of uh, his ask of his followers. And so if we really believe what we say we believe, then we need to love our neighbor. And our neighbors are everybody. Um, your neighbors are in this room. Your neighbors are beyond this room. And we want to make our community a better place. So we're really excited for Be Rich because it's a huge part of that. And I'm going to explain that just a little bit later. But every time you give here, every time you give here, you are supporting this idea that the gospel is for everybody and that our community should be a better place. And for that, we are so, so, so grateful. In just a minute, the ushers are going to come and they're going to pass some baskets around. Um, so that you can give in person if you'd like today. Uh, we're also we give you the option to give online. You can scan this QR code, or you can go to tcat.church slash give. Uh, it's a really great, easy way that you can start giving once or recurring, however you'd like to do that, um, through our website. And I'm going to explain how to get back to that for something else just a little bit later. So if you have your phone out, make sure you check that out during this time. I'm going to pray, um, and then we're going to have uh, our ushers come forward, and we're going to sing another great song. So bow your heads with me. Father God, I just want to thank you again uh, for um, this day that you've given us to be together. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this um, opportunity we get um, to gather uh, and to give and to realize that you've given us so much and we get to give back to you in this way. Uh, God, just bless this money be used for those who need it. Uh, bless us in our service. Uh, and through the message today, would you just speak through me, speak in spite of me, uh, so that all of us can hear your truth today because your truth will set us free. God, we love you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh man, uh, let me just say really quick before we begin with this message. So the young lady that just sang that song um, stepped up and stepped in in a huge way, and wasn't she amazing? I mean, how about another round of applause for her? Uh, just absolutely incredible. Um, we were so blessed by amazing musicians and, and uh, people here at TCAD, and, um, you know, and now I have to try to follow that with some sort of message, so I'm going to do my best today. Uh, but it's not going to be hard because Be Rich is my favorite time of year. Um, be Rich is our annual month-long campaign of generosity and good deeds that we where we spread all over Tuscaloosa County and do what we've been, you know, some of you all do this every month and every week, and many of us as a church, we, we try to offer ways that we can be for Tuscaloosa every single month, but this is like our all-in moment where for the next 30 days, we are going to be all in, all over our community, helping some really great nonprofits, helping some really amazing people uh, get a leg up from, from hard times that they've been in, uh, giving a, a lot of uh, our time and our money and our talents to people who could desperately need it to make our community a better place. And I cannot thank you enough for being here for Be Rich Sunday kickoff. It's going to be awesome. Uh, over the next 30 days, you're going to learn a lot about your community. Maybe some of it you knew, maybe some of it you don't. I mean, we talk all the time about being for Tuscaloosa, and we're excited to showcase some some really great nonprofits who are doing a lot of hard, great work in our community and try to connect you with those same nonprofits so that you can help them make a difference too. Uh, but I find myself kind of, as we kick off Be Rich this year, uh, I find myself kind of in this tension of the moment in the season that the church, not just TCAT, but the church in America and, and really globally seems to find itself in, uh, in, in what we call, and you're going to hate me for saying this phrase out loud, okay, but I'm going to say it, okay, I think we're far enough removed from this moment that we can say this out loud, but the new normal. Uh, we are living in, and you can get your groans out now if you want, okay, but we are living in what we've been calling for two years now the new normal, right? Post- COVID pandemic, if that's really where we are at this point, uh, things kind of look different. And the church is one of those things that looks different. It does. Now, you might look to your left and look to your right and think, you know, three years ago, I knew somebody who was here and now they're not, or the church used to look different or whatever else. And, and, and I think globally, this is a thing. It's not just here in Tuscaloosa. I think globally, the church is trying to find its footing in this kind of new world that we're in. And we don't quite know what that looks like yet. Um, and the interesting thing that's on top of that is not only did we have that season happen where now we're coming back and trying to rebuild or put the church back together, but we're also living in a season of time where, where um, the, the culture of the people that are outside the church have more evidence than ever to be frustrated with Christians and the church and everything else. And it's spilling over everywhere. Um, th this... Uh, <laughs> This week, I was reading, uh, there's a comedian that I like, um, that I follow, and, and he, he actually lives in Birmingham. I'm not going to tell you who it is, because you might figure out where all this stuff is, but um, he comments regularly, he's a Jesus follower, and he comments regularly on uh, the Coleman Daily News, uh, if you ever followed any of that social media site, and they do um, a weekly kind of Bible post of some kind, usually it's on Wednesdays, they'll post something, and he usually comments something about his faith. Well, he did that this week. And then immediately, or uh, several weeks ago, I should say, he did that and immediately just got ripped. I mean, just from one side and down the other, people ripping on the church and Christianity and, uh, and then Christians ripping on other Christians. There were, there were people saying, well, that's not, you know, popular Christianity and you're, you're not biblical and all this stuff and back and forth. And then in the middle of that, my favorite post, someone said, Christians calling other Christians non-Christian is the most Christian thing I've ever seen. Uh, and I want to laugh and cry at the same time. Do you feel that? Like, I want to laugh and I want to cry at the same time. And so the church just finds itself in this weird place. But we're trying to figure out who we are, right? Who, who are we as a church, as Jesus followers? What did this previous season we've come out of mean? How do we move forward? Is there a moving forward? Can we get the old normal back? Um, you know, all of those things. We're asking all these questions. And in the center of it um, is this temptation to just kind of sit back and do nothing. Uh, I know it's a temptation that, that I have felt before. We'll just wait it out, um, you know, but, but, but honestly, I don't think that's the right answer. And in fact, when I was joking about this very story with some pastor friends of mine, I, I told them what I saw and I read some of the stuff about how people were so upset with the church and they more or less were dismissive, like, well, we'll just wait for another generation and everything will be fine. And I'm like, wow, are you kidding? So we're just gonna wait. The church is gonna sit back and do nothing until we get, a, you know, this, this season ends and something else better happens. So they're asking all these questions about what, what this must mean for culture for us now and the generation later. I think we're asking the wrong questions. I just, I just think we're asking the wrong questions. If you ask the wrong questions, you're going to get the wrong answers. Andy Stanley puts it this way, and this is one of my favorite quotes from him. It's tempting to do nothing and complain about everything. As Jesus followers, that option has been removed from us. Ouch. 
It's, it is. It's tempting to complain and do nothing, but as Jesus followers, that option has been removed from us. So if that's the case, and we find ourselves in this kind of new season of time, what questions should we ask? What are the questions we should be asking about where we are right now, and what might we find to do? Well, believe it or not, I, I, I found a story in, in the New Testament that, that where the church found itself in a similar place. And no, there wasn't a global pandemic, and no, there wasn't you know, um, some of the things we faced kind of culturally today, but there was quite a bit of, of confrontation and quite a bit of heartache that the church was facing in a season of time where they had to make some decisions and they had to decide what they were gonna do to move forward and what might happen to them, but also what might happen to the people that were around them. And I wanna tell you that story today. It's all found in the book of Acts. It actually starts around the time that the church experienced its first martyrship. Uh, there was a, the very first martyr of the church. If you grew up in Sunday school like I did, you know that this person's name is Stephen. Stephen was the guy that the church had picked to give food and resources to the widows. He was also incredibly gifted in a lot of different ways. And so um, right after Jesus is crucified you know, by Pilate, it became kind of open season on Jesus' followers. The, the church, the religious, le- religious leaders of the day, they were really trying hard to kind of stamp out this Jesus movement, this Nazarene cult, as they called it. And they were trying to kill every Christian they could find. And so Stephen became the first one of those. Now, what they didn't know was that they thought they'd put Stephen on trial and have him disprove everything and kind of um, make this end but what ended up happening was that they put Stephen on trial and he actually shared his story and shared his faith publicly so powerfully that it created another movement of people and everyone that was around them began to become Jesus followers too and so the only thing they could think to do was drag him out of town and kill him and they did they stoned him to death it was a terrible horrible way to die but what happened was that Pilate didn't do anything and the Roman governors didn't do anything. When this happened, and there were no repercussions for the death of Stephen, it became open season on every Christian that they could find. Every Christian was rounded up. They, they started uh, scattering them from Jerusalem. In fact, it says that they, they scattered hundreds of miles in every direction away from where this persecution's epicenter was. They couldn't gather the way that they had thought they were going to. They, they couldn't um, keep together and share resources with each other. And so they were just kind of scattered everywhere. This didn't start off the way they thought it was going to start off. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 8, this is where it kind of begins. On that day, right, the day that Stephen was killed, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So just like a small group of people stays in this place where Jesus had walked the streets, right? In this place where they thought was gonna be the centerpiece of the church. Everything they planned and everything they had going for them, um, you know, ended in that moment. So they thought it was going to, right? If they were writing the story in that moment, they may something like that say like this. So the Jesus movement ceased to be and its leaders were rounded up and executed. That's what they thought was going to happen. But far from it is what actually happened. What actually happened was that those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever, wherever they went. In other words, they just said, okay, um, well, you can't stop me from telling the story. And what I've experienced in my, you know, uh, my transformation, my change because of Jesus, you can't take that away from me. And I know what I believe and I know what I saw and I know what the truth is. So I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell the story. I'm just, I'm just going to tell the story. And that's what they decided to do. They just decided that they would tell the story. And so this is the context. This is like the, the preset of the, the actual story I want to tell you today. This is kind of the lead up to the moment. Is the church has been scattered and they're, they're, they've been pushed far and wide from their centerpiece and they're everywhere, hundreds of miles north, south, east, west from Jerusalem. And then when that happens, this particular kind of movement um, starts to really gain traction against the church. What happens is, Uh, this guy named Saul, who was kind of the chief inquisitor of the church at the time, later known as the Apostle Paul, came on the scene and decided he wanted to find every Christian he could, even the ones that were scattered. And he asked for permission to go to Damascus and round them up. And here's the thing that we don't know, like if you're not a map nerd like me, the walk from Jerusalem to Damascus one way was two weeks. It took Paul two weeks to walk from Jerusalem to Damascus. That's how desperate he was to get rid of all the Christians. He was going to go as far as he could, and that is as far as they'd actually went. If you grew up in church, you know that along that same Damascus road, as he was on his way to go persecute the Christians, Jesus shows up, confronts him. He's completely changed in his walk. He joins what he thought was the losing team and then proceeds to plant churches all over the Mediterranean rim. 
But right after his kind of conversion, right after he, he met the resurrected Jesus and changed his mind about what he needed to do for the church, he headed off and hid in Tarsus for a time. Um, and during that time, Barnabas and some of the other church leaders in Jerusalem were sent north to try to help some of these Christians that were, that were getting started. This church had grown like crazy. There were people everywhere, and they're sending for help. They're asking for help. It says, those who had been persecuted, this is in the 11th chapter, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. They, this church just grew. It just got crazy. And so the, the leaders in Jerusalem feel really spread thin. But it wasn't just that they were talking to Jews. At this point, something happened they did not expect to happen. The message started taking off with everybody. Gentiles, people who'd never even heard of Jerusalem, people who'd never been to Jerusalem before, hundreds of miles away, who, who had no perception or no opinion of the Jews whatsoever other than the, just another people, suddenly started accepting Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, and they, they went nuts. The church went crazy. This is what it says. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. They just kept telling the story. That's all they were doing. They just told the story. This is the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So many that they got completely overwhelmed. So Barnabas decides to go and find Saul. It says, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. This is how the story starts. Paul, who had been this great persecutor, persecutor of the church, person who thought the Christians were all wrong and all crazy, goes north to Antioch, shows up there with Barnabas, and he decides uh, that he's going to be a Jesus follower. Not only is he going to be a Jesus follower, he had no idea at the time, but he would write most of the New Testament. He would bring people to know the Lord in a way that no one had ever expected. Okay, It says, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples, this is how big this movement got, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Okay, so there's the context for the church, for the actual problem that's about to happen. They have spread far and wide. They've, they've found themselves growing in numbers like crazy. And then during this time, during this time, something bad happens. They're already scattered. They're already frustrated. They're already thin on resources. They're already thin on leaders. And then something happens. It says that during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and, and in other words, these, these leaders who were going to predict what might happen next in the world came down to Antioch where Paul and Barnabas and some of the other leaders were a long way away from home and they spread the news about something that was about to happen. They said, one of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread through the entire Roman world. Now when he say the word famine today, it really doesn't sound like it's that big a deal. It doesn't sound as scary as it really was. But famine in this day meant that entire generations of people could die that entire cities and entire villages could be wiped off the face of the earth, that people would literally starve to death. And so Agabus shows up and he goes, listen, there's this really bad famine that's coming. And you might think, just, just if, if, you're, if you're outside the church and you've never read this story before, you might think that the Christians would look at this and say, wait, the Roman world, the ones that have been persecuting us, the, the, the ones that shipped us out of town, the ones that aren't defending us, they're, they're gonna be hit by a famine. And you might, well, good you might think that they might respond that way that they would go awesome fantastic i'm glad that's happening that'll teach them look what god's doing right that, that they might be tempted to just go well let's just wait till that's over with and see what might happen next so they're already spread thin they're already spread thin they're, they're already looking for more leaders they had to go all the way to tarsus to find this guy who was just a persecutor of their whole movement not weeks before that might be the answer that they might want to give just for context, Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, actually adds in so that the people who are reading this later would remember when this happened. He said this actually happened during the time of Claudius, and Claudius was the emperor just before Nero, who was just the worst. <laughs> it was just the worst. He, he persecuted Christians like crazy. So the church finds itself in a place where they have to decide what to do. They're spread thin. Um, there's already been problems, there's already been persecution, there's already been people kind of pressing in on them. What should they do about this famine that's coming their way? Could they do anything? Could they offer up their prayers? Could they change their Facebook profile pictures? Uh, you know, are there things that they could do that might make a difference in this? Or are they going to, you know, just going to wait and see what might happen next? N.T. Wright, who's one of my favorite authors, sums up what the church decides to do next with some questions. 
These were questions that the church began to ask themselves in this season of time. And I think, I, I think that these are questions that the church now, not just TCAP, but the church, should be asking of the season we find ourselves in. And this is what N.T. Wright said. He wrote this during the pandemic. He said, The church asked, who will be at risk? How can we help? And who should we send? Now, those three questions to people who grew up around the church might sound like that's the obvious Sunday school answer to give, but here's what's profound about what the church did then that is so radical and so radically changed the world that these questions seem normal to us. There wasn't even a word existing in Greek culture. There wasn't even a word to describe this kind of generosity. It didn't exist. There was no generosity like this. Generosity was, I, I'll do this for you with hopes that you might do something back for me later. There was always a getting even involved in generosity. And so there was no way, like this was a moment where the church was already thin. They didn't have a whole lot of options. And they hear that this famine is coming and they decide, well, we've got to, you know, someone's going to get hurt by this. What can we do and who should we send? It wasn't, can we do this? How could this happen? What might this mean for us? It was, who will be at risk? How can we help? And who should we send? And I just think that it's beautiful that this was the foundation of our forebears as Jesus followers. The reason we're here in Tuscaloosa today is because a group of people all the way across the ocean in the Middle East decided that in a pivotal moment when the church could, could circle the wagons and stay together and try to fight it out, or they could try to make a difference, they chose to make a difference. And by choosing to make a difference, they had no idea that they were writing the story of the church in the United States years and years and years later. But here we are. Who will be at risk? How can we help? And who should we send? And this is what they decided to do. The scripture tells us in Acts chapter 11. Then the disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help to the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did, this they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. And I don't have time to go through this whole story, but, but Barnabas and Saul's journey to take this whole movement of generosity, the, the, the gift that had been collected all over the north, down to the people in the Roman world who were suffering, is an amazing story. You're gonna have to go read it sometime. Open your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 11, read this story, it's awesome, the things that Paul goes through. But I gotta ask this, okay? Why did they with no context, right, with, with no pre-existing example or evidence of this kind of generosity, why did they decide to do this? Why, why is it that the Jesus followers in that day decided that this was the answer to the question of what should happen next? Given all the persecution they faced, given all the hardship they faced, given all the difficulties that were ahead of them, why did they do this? Well, I think it's because they suddenly realized that they had become part and under the law of Christ. See, they had experienced what many of us have experienced, that, that they had a sin debt that they couldn't pay. They, they had come to realize that they had broken a sin in their life that they could not wash away or heal on their own, and Jesus himself had given himself to free them from that sin debt, to free them from that burden and to heal the wounds that they had in their hearts and their souls, the, to, to, to move them from darkness into light. Jesus had done something in them that no one had ever been able to do. God had done something in Jesus that had changed the world. And so they found themselves in a place where they're looking at people who could never help them back, right? That they, they could never repay them for what they were about to do. And they decided that because of what Jesus had done for them, they would do for others. And as I said earlier, there was a word that was invented for this. There wasn't even a word until this moment. The word is caritas. The word caritas just means extravagant generosity, giving it away where you expect nothing in return. And this is the first example of it in history. This moment when the church faced such hardship was the moment when extravagant generosity was created. And if you don't, if you don't mind me saying, this is a moment where, where the church actually found its identity. They, they found themselves as being people who loved God and loved others. They lived into this, this call from their Savior, from their Lord, to love God and to love others. So here's the question, okay? Let's fast forward to 2022. The church universal finds itself in a place where we're still trying to find our footing. <laughs> we're still trying to figure out what our reputation and culture is. We're still trying to put ourselves back together from the difficulties of, of pandemic and, and recession and all the other things that we seem to be having come our way. So what should we do? What should the church do in this season of time? 
Well, we think that the answer to this question in a big, big way for us is be rich. It's this movement of generosity, this movement of caritas across our community, across our county, across our world. See, we know that everybody matters to God whether God matters to them or not. Everybody matters to God whether God matters to them or not. And one of the ways in which we can prove that is through extravagant generosity towards the people that are in our community, in our world. We, we can make the world a better place. I, I've said this before. I tease my children every single morning, and I mean it. I'm joking, but I mean it. When they get out of the car, I ask them, hey, are you ready to make the world a better place? Yes, it's Zootopia. Get over my corniness. I'm a dad of little girls, okay? It's, it's, it is what it is. Are you ready to make the world a better place? Every, every one of us have an opportunity every day. And as I said last week, I think all of us want to. We all want to make a difference. We all want to do something to make our community better. We just don't, don't often know how. And so what Be Rich is, is a movement, is an idea, is that we did all that hard work for you. You just have to be faithful. And so if you can say yes, in a moment where you're asked to be faithful, you can make a difference in our community. You can make a difference in our world. This, this movement of Be Rich is not about like you gaining money in your pocket. It's, it's actually given from a conversation between the Apostle Paul and someone he was mentoring named Timothy. He, he wrote out to Timothy who was trying to figure out how to become a leader in the church and what he needed to do with these people that he was telling the story to. And this is what Paul said. He said, look, if you, if you want to if you want to get your people to move in the right direction, here's what you should do, Timothy. Command them, those who are rich in this present world, and for the record, if you have more than you need, by definition, globally, you are rich. Rich in this present world to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. This is where our be rich phrase comes from. A simple command, a simple idea, that those who follow Jesus would be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And so what does that look like for us? Well, it's a month-long campaign of generosity that that looks like this. We're going to give, we're going to serve, and we're going to love. Over the next 30 days, you're going to have the opportunity to give, serve, and love, to show people in our community just how awesome our God really is. And today is the launching of what we call our Give Campaign. And, and uh, if you've been with us before, you know that what we ask you to do today before you leave is to give thirty nine ninety five. $39.95. The only thing we're asking for is to have the opportunity for everybody this month to give $39.95. Now, here's the thing. Some of you all can't quite give $39.95. Okay, and that's okay. Give what you can. And some of you all could add zeros to the end of this. And that's okay, too. Give what you feel led to do. But the ask is that today as we kick off, everyone would give $39.95. And we pledge as a church that every dime that comes into our Be Rich account this month, we will give 100% of it away. We will not take any of it. 100% of what goes in goes out. Last year, we had the great privilege to collect and give out over $13,000 to our community through this movement. Uh, and this is our opportunity to do that again. What I love is some of you all set up a recurring gift last year and you've been giving to Be Rich every month and I'm just so grateful for that. Uh, we have that, we've been tracking it, we're gonna use all that money. But, but what this goal is, is for us to be able to give and serve and love our way to support some really great people in our community who are doing great things. When I got here, one of the goals that I had was to help us get out in the community so that people would understand that we really wanna make, the, you know, we'll make our community a better place. And so rather than centralizing food banks and centralizing clothing things and centralizing all of the stuff here, we just said, hey, what are the best nonprofits in town that are already helping kids? What are the best nonprofits in town that are already helping people who are at risk? What are the best nonprofits in town that are providing medical care or providing food or providing resources? How can we go and say, look, you're already killing it. Let us, let us send some money and some resources your way so you can dream and do bigger things. Last year, we were able to partner with Boys and Girls Club and help them redo their recreational space so that their, so that their outreach um, in Alberta could grow, and it did. Um, we also partnered with Love, Inc., which is a community resource that shares food and clothing and various other resources to at-risk people throughout, people throughout our community. We helped them set up a store so they could raise money for Thanksgiving baskets. They did. <laughs> Last year, we also partnered with West Alabama Food Bank. We sent volunteers, we sent time so they could spread food all over our community. And this year is no different. This year, we're gonna partner with some of those same organizations and we're adding a few things. We have some great opportunities to support teachers throughout our community this year, to support law enforcement officers throughout our community this year. 
your children, um, one, of the, one of the goals that we have was this year was to give your kids, if you have elementary school age kids, the chance to be rich this month too. And so they're going to get a, a piece of paper uh, from Emily today and some of their small group leaders. And on a table right back out here are some little boxes that are just like this big. And we're going to pack a we love you box for every teacher at Holt Elementary School. Don't tell them, it's a secret. Some of y'all are teachers at elementary school, so be surprised when you get them. Uh, but we're going to pack a, a thank you gift for every teacher at Holt Elementary School and for every teacher at the alternative school. We have the opportunity to do that through y'all's generosity. It's just, there's a little instructions on how you can do it. You as a family can do it together. They can write notes. They can color on the side of the box. It's going to be great uh, that they can be a part of that. We're also partnering with Davis Emerson Middle School to do a project for Dr. Prince there, the new principal. We're partnering with Central High School to do some work there. We've got pro- opportunities for you to be a part of this movement all month long. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to collect money. And on the 23rd, we're going to go out in our community as a church. We'll come here this mor- that morning, have a really great time of worship, and then just head out into our community to serve that afternoon. And the only thing we're asking for is 100% participation. That's it. That everybody would try to do something, right? It doesn't mean you do everything, but everybody would try to do something so that we can all be rich together this month. So in just a minute, I'm going to pray. Um, and when I get done praying, the music's going to come on and there's going to be a QR code that'll pop up on the screen. That's going to be, that's going to activate the Be Rich Fund for this year. Uh, and here's how this is going to work. You just have to scan the QR code or go to tcat.church slash give, select the Be Rich Fund and give what you were willing to give today. And again, the ask is that you would give today. Don't wait until you get home. Don't say you're going to do it and go home and forget about it. Do it today before you walk out of the door, and we will be for Tuscaloosa. We will be rich together. Let me pray for us. Father God, we are so grateful for the kickoff of this extravagant time of generosity. God, not because we want to show off, uh, not because we want to, you know, be better, but because we feel, God, you've called us as Jesus followers to make a difference, and we are going to do that together. We're going to make a difference this month. Uh, We're going to make our community a better place this month by giving and serving and loving our way into people understanding how much you love them. God, we know that everybody matters to you, whether they matter to you, whether you matter to them or not. And so God, help us um, through our love, through our giving, our serving, and our loving this month to just show how much love you have for each and every one of us. God, we love you. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Ready, set, give. Welcome to be, welcome to be rich 2022.